um, subwoofers are popular. Hey, it's good to have you back on the channel. We've had a few weeks off from making videos in August to kind of regroup and figure out what's next. And I've got some really cool stuff coming up to share with you in the next few months. Starting off with some really cool giveaways, including my Cozy Roadie Packable Office Chair. It comes with its own road case. It's worth around $700, and I'm gonna send it to someone who signs up for the email list. That's all you gotta do. I know everybody gets enough emails already, but the more people that subscribe to the channel here on YouTube, the more I'm worried about something happening to the channel. And I constantly hear about folks having issues with notifications and other features uh, that let them know when there's new videos. So I'd encourage anybody that's had those issues to sign up for the email list and get those notifications directly. I only send out a message when there's actually new content or something time sensitive like a giveaway and I definitely don't ever sell the email list to anybody else. Anyway, we're kicking off the fall with PA of the day's September celebration. I personally haven't seen a sub in real life since sometime in March maybe, but perhaps you've done better in your location than I have here. When PA of the day reached out to ask if I had any sub specific content coming up to share this month, I was kind of scratching my head to figure out what I was going to do uh, since I don't have any subs here and haven't really covered a ton on the channel. But then I remembered a couple years ago, AES at NAM in 2019, I caught a few minutes of Dave Rat's talk on his approach to sub deployment and design and it's really cool. He speaks regularly on this topic and has a bunch of videos that I'll link down below as well. So after this little intro, you can dig a little deeper into what he's actually talking about. But I thought that sharing the first 10 minutes of this specific talk would be a really cool one for September because he really gives a breakdown, a very good intro of uh, all the different types of subwoofers and might get you thinking about some concepts and ideas that you hadn't considered or heard about before. So be sure to subscribe to Dave's channel if you haven't. He's been doing a lot of videos recently and his members only posts are really fun. Members only. I look forward to those every week. Let's head back to 2019 in Anaheim, California at the winter NAM show. People love subs. I mean, they're just good, like big engines and cars. Uh, when I first started, Doing shows in 1980, subs on an aux end was not a popular thing. The Oz Festival in 83, you know, there's a lot of low-end boxes, but subs on an aux were just beginning to gain some traction. Everything, they were just low boxes, with dedicated subs. And it was difficult to make um, powerful subs. The amps were small. Crown DC-300s only do so much, or PSA-2s, a very low power, big heavy, weak amplifiers. Speaker technology didn't allow for much. Um, and system processing and protection was very poor. So you use the uh, avoid the clip light method of protection yeah. yell, and yell at the sound engineer, which usually often didn't work out well. Uh, demand for low frequency as a sound system vendor. De demand for more and more low frequency at shows, EDM as a music is so popular and um, also just the desire to reach frequencies that aren't done, make shows special. I mean, the purpose of doing a rock show or any event is to give someone a memory they're gonna hold on to and never forget. And if we can create something that they don't normally hear, that'll help that cause. Um, the festivals that we're doing have a much more diverse, you know, the days of us doing just rock or one type of festival. Now you get a very diverse um, artist genre base. Reaching those, how low can it go? Those frequencies is a challenge and fun to reach. Um, and the control, as he was talked about tying the amplifier into the transducer that has acoustic loading awareness. All of that helps push uh, driver protection to new levels and helps us reach new heights without increasing our truck pack or keeping uh, our truck packs smaller. Um, and then also there's a lot of development in low frequency array directivity, building subwoofer arrays that cancel sound where we don't want it to go and make it louder where we do. Um, nobody's really come up with one to figure out how to make it stop when it gets there. Uh, utilitarian, okay, sound reinforcement goals. Utilitarian, there's sound systems 
when people are putting together a sound system, you kind of put an idea in your mind. What am I going to do? What do I want to achieve? Do I want just people to be able to hear what I'm saying intelligibly? Um, am I striving for acoustic realism? Do I want someone to be fooled in an orchestra? Do I want to have absolutely no impact upon the initial signal and try and minimize that, which we, in my opinion, have um, significantly failed at achieving? Um, unique audio experience, coming in, doing an EDM show or doing a Roger Waters show, surround sound, something that gives some, creates some sound or some aspect that um, we haven't heard before, creating those memories. And sonic saturation impact, really just hitting overload, putting people into a trance or, or a mesmerizing low frequency um, information to try and um, going over some, so what I've done is I'm trying to take this product in this context and find a way to implement it in a deployable and an exciting manner. Um, so I kind of start from scratch. What kind of enclosure am I going to put it in and what are the assets and detriments of each? <coughs> Sealed enclosure, it's got uh, the ability to go extremely low. You bought the the low end cutoff point is basically tuned to zero. And if you make the enclosure bigger, it's louder at a lower note. Um, problem with sealed enclosures and pretty much the holy grail of all low frequency design is what do you do with the sound coming off the back of the speaker? Because half the sound's coming off the front, half of it's coming off the back. And if they touch each other, all the sound goes away. They cancel out. So now what do you do with the sound coming off the back? And all of this subwoofer design stuff is based around creative ways to effectively use the sound from the back of the speaker, or much of it. Uh, sealed enclosure, captures it inside the box, puts some foam in there, or some fiberglass, and tries to erase it and eliminate it from existence. And you only get half the energy. A reflex reported enclosure, the next one up, you grab in the front, using that for the audience, the back of the enclosure, you put it into a chamber with a hole, a Hemholtz radiator, and it let it resonate around, time delay it a bit, and spit it out the hole. A little bit late, half a cycle late at a certain frequency, so that it gives you a little boost. So you're using the energy from the back of the speaker to augment the sound in the front. The energy in the back's a little bit late, but it comes out the hole, adds up, and gives you more output. And then below that, you lose even more. So there's some advantages and disadvantages. It's a little wonky and tends to be, the better you make it, the louder you make it, the more resonant it is. And we see that a lot with very highly tuned subs, one note wonders, we call them. You know, they got that, per, that note. They'll just keep hitting that same note. No. Uh, you get a lot of measurable SPL, you get a good spec on a spec sheet, and highly desirable for certain genres of music, um, and kind of the uh, very challenging and not desirable for other types of music, sonic realism or flat sound, uh, because you're getting an artifact from the enclosure which is difficult to correct for, if not impossible. Um, Bandpass. Bandpass are interesting because you start to, you put a chamber in front and a chamber behind to increase it. Basically a low pass, a chamber in front, uh, loads the driver in the front side, and I'm not really that good at explaining all this band pass stuff, but I have started designing around it due to this driver that I'm with, the M4s. And uh, basically you have two chambers, you tune one high, you tune one low, and the output between the two increases. Uh, horn loaded is cool because horn loaded really does a good job of connecting the driver with the air. You got a small speaker drivers in general, all the ones we use, even these 30s, are relatively small versus the wavelengths that they're reproducing, subwoofer wavelengths. And a lot of what they're doing is just pissing in the wind. They're just, it's like um, taking and hanging a sheet and hitting it with a hammer or hitting it with your fist. And that little sheet, that big sheet hanging, you just, you're only moving this much of the sheet. So the way is, if you have a horn-loaded box, maybe instead of hitting it with your fist, you take and roll up some cardboard into a cone and you hit that with this cone. So now you're moving a lot more of that sheet and your hand isn't that much heavier. 
a uh, horn loaded cabinet helps connect that driver with the air much more efficiently. Not without ramifications, though. The horn loaded boxes are limited by the horn mouth. It's very difficult to make a horn that goes very low without also making it the size of a house. And there's some non-linearities, but those can be corrected for more. Transmission lines, I really like transmission lines, and I'd like to see more. They're difficult to build. The concept of that is you have the front of the speaker radiating out, and you take the back of the speaker and you make a really long tube, so it travels all the way around. By the time it gets out, it's back in polarity with the front of the speaker, or half, you know, it's, the, it's out of polarity when it comes, and it's half a wavelength out, so it sums back in. You kind of use it, but there's no box, there's no resonator. If you do it right, there's no resonance. It's just clear. They sound great. It's just difficult to build. Um, building these partial transmission lines where you've delayed, you've created these long tubes for the back of the speaker helps you achieve some um, of those advantageous aspects. Does that sound about right? Am I doing okay? These technical parts that are... Awesome. You can look at anything out there and take these factors and determine what the designer of a sound system was thinking or aiming for or the owners of the company made them focus on in, if you look at these factors and how they prioritized them. You can look at a sound system and say, wow, this thing's really loud, but it's huge. Or if, if it's, it's loud, it sounds great, but it's incredibly expensive. And they all weigh against each other. If you make something louder, it's gonna get bigger and heavier. If you make it sound better, it's gonna become less efficient and not get as loud and start to cost more. And if you make it beautiful and ergonomic, the cost goes up and the, the, maybe you're using up more internal space for handles and stuff and then um, your efficiency goes down. So weighing how you balance these out really determines the end product. And I like to look at the various manufacturers throughout the world and kind of figure out their positions so that's intro to Subwoofer's uh, little quick clip from the start of Dave's longer talk. That was a much more involved talk. They get into amplifier design and all sorts of different stuff uh, in that talk specifically that's, uh, to be honest, got over my head pretty quickly there uh, towards the end. So uh, definitely dig in more on Dave's channel if you have more interest in the, the more advanced concepts. He really does go into quite a bit of detail and it's a perfect way to kind of level up your sub game while we have some time here to uh, think about those kind of things. Be sure to enter for the giveaway if you want the cozy roadie chair and I'll be back with more videos very soon. Thanks for watching.